Welcome to Y-Lab, the makerspace located in the basement workshops of the historic David Dunlap Observatory in Richmond Hill, Ontario, Canada, and where the electronics panel in the giant telescope on the left has a light bulb to keep the electronics warm that hasn't been replaced and that has been on steady since 1933. This is Lesson 11 in Y-Lab's Canadian Amateur Radio Training Series. This is a relatively easy section, so go for 95% on the quiz. Common battery features. Batteries are known as cells or storage cells. And they supply DC power with a positive and a negative terminal. The plus side is the anode. The negative th side is the cathode. And they're a source of power, or really, they're a source of voltage or electromotive force. Uh, remember from our basic formulas, V is equivalent to E, voltage or electromotive force. The current flows from plus to minus. Think AC, anode to cathode. Now, a little quirk of physics long time ago when people discovered electricity they decided that one side was plus and the other side was minus and that the current flows from plus to minus but electrons actually flow in the opposite direction to current that's because the electron was discovered after they came up with all the current rules and formula and they didn't want to change all that because all the textbooks were already written uh, now, you'll see a symbol in electronics that look like what's below. Technically, they say, oh, one cell or two cells. That's pretty much meaningless in a diagram. All that's important is the voltage. Now, the most common batteries are not rechargeable. Again, the test material was written back in the Dark Ages. And they'll talk about flashlights and other home batteries, the older ones being carbon zinc. Uh, you hardly hear anybody saying that anymore. They'll just say older batteries. The vast majority of our newer batteries are alkaline chemistry. And they're usually one and a half volts. That can be the double A's, the triple A's, uh, the C cells, the D cells. They're all one and a half volts. And the test refers to non-rechargeable batteries as conventional or flashlight batteries generally whether they're alkaline or carbon zinc. Rechargeable batteries, the dominant one at the time the test was written was this big lead acid battery in the car, runs about 12 volts. We now have newer lithium ion batteries that have very high energy storage for their weight. This is what allows us to make electric cars. It's what allows laptops to run. Uh, now, a short circuit, if you were to connect the wire to the two, between the two ends of the batteries, that's a fast release of energy. There's hardly any resistance in the wire, and uh, it's enough to cause the battery to uh, blow up. It's enough to heat up that wire. Even with a 9-volt battery, hooking the terminals together will burn your fingers in no time at all. And the lithium ions are the ones that are usually in the news when you hear about a smartphone fire or a laptop fire. And uh, most of that is caused by manufacturing defects that result in internal short circuits. And uh, fortunately, manufacturing has improved a lot. and We don't hear many of those stories like we used to four or five years ago. There are a couple of other rechargeable battery technologies. Uh, nickel cadmium or NICAD, nickel metal hydride. Uh, but generally, we don't hear too much about those anymore. Lithium ion has really taken over everything. So remember, never short circuit a battery that's never hooked just the wire between the two ends, and especially never a lithium ion battery, because the amount of power that's storing is absolutely incredible. Now, batteries have an internal resistance. If you measure the voltage across a standalone battery, you'll see about 1.5 volts. Uh, generally, batteries will go above that. When they're new, you'll see 1.6, maybe even a little more on a rechargeable lithium ion. And then it gradually goes lower as the battery's discharged. 
an old flashlight that was interesting because it would just take the battery and the battery could go as low as it wanted down to 1.2 1.1 volts and you would notice that the bulb got dimmer in the newer flashlights that use leds they've got little circuitry in there that will actually cut out below a certain voltage so your flashlight is either bright or dead now if you measure the voltage again when the battery's in a circuit you'll see a drop maybe even to 1.2 volts hey is my battery dead then you disconnect it and it's magically back to one and a half volts that's because the battery isn't perfect it actually has its own internal resistance and that resistance only comes into play when your battery's connected in a circuit so you've added a battery and a resistance to the circuit and whenever you have a resistance in a circuit you have a bit of a voltage drop so that's what's going on there when your battery's in the circuit now so our little AAA batteries are one and a half volts, our bigger double A's are one and a half volts, and our enormous C and D cells are one and a half volts. What's the difference? Well, how much current the battery can deliver, or its power rating. Uh, and so that'll be two things. It'll be how long the battery will last. It'll also be how much current it can deliver at any point. So you get a rechargeable double a battery the latest ones will be good for say 2500 milliamp hours that means it can deliver 2500 milliamps for an hour maybe okay because what won't be shown is say its maximum drain how many milliamps it can handle so generally uh, you'll have a current rating and say it's 2500 milliamps so it would be good for an hour the battery won't last as long if you draw higher than that and it will also affect the overall life of the battery batteries in parallel and series act like resistors we covered that in one of the other lessons and so if we have two and a half one two one and a half volt batteries each rated at a thousand milliamp hours if we need three volts we can connect the two in series so when you add them up head to tail um, like two pumps one feeding the other you get twice the pressure or the voltage and so now you have three volts if you want higher current you connect them in parallel so you'll still have one and a half volts across the terminals but you can deliver twice the current or twice the flow so you'll have a thousand plus a thousand two thousand milliamp hours the power is the same in both cases because it's pa power is voltage time current we've either got in parallel or in series two batteries adding up to three volts delivering a thousand milliamps which is the same result as one and a half in parallel delivering 2000 milliamps in both cases multiply the two and we've got the same power three watts so in series we're getting higher voltage higher pressure in parallel we're getting higher current higher flow ham radios usually run on 12 volts dc and hey perfectly matches a car battery at home you'll have a power supply that's going to convert 120 volts AC to 12 volts DC. Okay. If your portable works in your car and not at home, it's probably that you've got a, an issue with your power supply. And some of that is how much current it's supplying. So 12 volts is one thing, but how much current do you need? You know a big radio uh, if you've got your uh, your full license you can be punching out a thousand watts and that's a lot of power and uh, you know you can add up eight one and a half volt batteries alkaline cells in series they will not deliver that kind of power they won't deliver the watts you need uh, so power supplies often people will cobble them together out of say an old PC power supply 
Uh, yeah, it'll deliver the voltage, but will it deliver the current for your radio? And so when you're looking at some of the big transceivers, you've got some pretty heavy-duty power supplies for those. You've got to make sure you can handle the power rating of the radio. Okay, Inside the power supply, you've got different components. You've got a transformer. That's to go from 120 volts AC to 12 volts DC. You've got diodes to rectify the current from AC into pulsing DC. You've got capacitors to smooth out the pulsing into a nice flat 12 volt DC. Okay? If you're getting a hum from your transceiver or your power supply, it's going to be from one of these components, the transformer, the diodes, or the capacitors. Okay. Some general power supply tips. Get more than the minimum required. Okay. If you need 12 volts with a 5 amp power draw, you know, power is volts times current, so it's 12 volt times 5 amps. That's 60 watts. That's the minimum you need. Go over that. You don't want to be driving your power supply at its max level. Then you want to fuse between your power supply and the radio. So if something happens with the current, you're not blowing up your radio. You always put your fuse as close to the battery as possible. Okay, the fuse will control the maximum power drop. And you want to get it as close to the battery as possible because if you're drawing too much current, even the wire from the battery can heat up and cause a fire. So get that fuse as close to the battery as possible uh, so that it's blowing as fast as possible before things heat up. Okay. General power supply safety. Okay. Before working on a power supply, Power it off and unplug it. There's live wires in there. Okay. For extra safety, some radios, you've got the case, or they call it the cabinet. So when we say cabinet here, we're not talking about the, the case where you store your radio. The actual case of the radio might have a switch to disable power if you open it or remove the cover just for safety to make sure you're not doing something stupid. It really doesn't take much to kill you. Okay. 110 volts, yeah, it can harm you. A lot of people say it doesn't. A lot of it's going to depend on the amount of current provided. But 30 volts is enough to kill you. That's what, you know, everything in here is a test question. So all it takes is 30 volt. In current at high voltages, as little as 20 amps can kill you. And the most vulnerable part of your body is the heart. If that manages to get close to it, to get through, uh, that's where you're a dead meat sack. Now, if someone is burned or in contact with high voltage, what do you do? If you can, first turn off the power. If you see signs of electrical wires and somebody down, and you don't know how to turn off the power, call 911 and don't touch anything. If you can absolutely verify that the power is off, first call 911. This is basic first aid stuff. Or instruct somebody else to and tell them to come back, report back to you so you know it's done. You will find that if you give orders to a stranger in a situation like that, People are usually standing around wishing they could help, not knowing what to do. And you just point, say, you, call 911. Tell them someone's been electrocuted. Then report back to me because they may have to go find somebody else with a phone. Once you've done that, the emergency services has been contacted. If you're trained in first aid, provide first aid. Pull the person away from the hazard. But always safety first. Okay, securing your radio. Remember, you need a license to operate an amateur radio at amateur radio frequencies. You are responsible for your radio and ensuring that nobody else is using it. 
So depending on what your household situation is, depending on what your vehicle situation is, just turning it off might not be enough. You are responsible for it. You know, if any doubt at home, lock it up. You can get key operated switches for the power line so that it can't be turned on. In the car, remove the mic. Take it with you if somebody else is going to be using your car. And, and, you know, don't just leave it in the glove compartment. Hey, look, I can hook this up and transmit. Okay, now go to quiz number 11. The links are in the comments section below. And this is one of the easier quizzes, so it's one you want to work until you get 95% accuracy. Again, we're YLab Makerspace at https colon slash slash ylab.ca. And good luck on this quiz.